Hey there, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Just Cause Robotics. For today's video, I am going to basically just cut up and re-edit a live stream that I did last week showing the cost of combat robotics based on a survey I conducted with over a hundred different robots. I hope that you enjoy this follow-up to the part one video where I showed how much my robots cost, where here you can take a look at basically what it costs to actually get involved in the sport of combat robotics as a whole, with the perspective of looking at weight classes from 150 grams all the way up to 30 pounds. All right, hope you enjoy. Basically, my plan for this was to kind of treat this stream a little bit more like a TED talk than like a typical video, because there's a lot of information to cover. Let me switch back to just me for a sec. There's a lot of information to cover, and I know that just looking at numbers is pretty boring, but I need to talk through it somehow for to convey any of the information that I got from this builder survey to you guys in a way that actually makes sense. So my goal with this stream is kind of twofold. Number one, I want to convey to everybody basically what it takes to get started in the sport. And part of that is obviously money. I think that that is the biggest concern for most people. In fact, I sent out a survey asking people what the hardest part of combat robotics is. And like 40% of people out of five options chose the cost and time and money as the biggest barrier to entry for this sport. So I think by actually figuring out what those numbers are might make it seem a little bit more approachable to people. So to that end, I sent out a survey in around March of uh, 2022 before the March Norwalk Havoc event. And the survey went out to a whole bunch of people. Let me pull up my PowerPoint again so you can see what I'm talking about. So I sent out this survey to a bunch of different groups of people. I sent it out in the Combat Robotics Facebook group and sent it out in the Norwalk Havoc League Discord. I got the survey link into an email that was sent out to all the March 2022 Norwalk Havoc competitors. And I also posted it on my channel community page a while back. So basically the goal was to try and spread as far and wide of a net as possible to get as broad of information as possible. Now on this survey, I was asking exclusively about the smaller combat robot weight classes from 150 grams all the way up to 30 pound featherweights. Um, so here in America, the 150 gram class is usually referred to as the fairy weight class. In the UK, it's referred to as ant weight, which is really confusing because here in the US, Ant weights are one pound or 454 grams. Um, so yeah, essentially the uh, the weight class breakdown that I surveyed was 150 grams, one pound ant weight, then three pound beetle weight or 1.5 kilogram if you're in the UK, then the 12 pound hobby weights, and then the 30 pound or 13.6 kilogram feather weights. So those are basically the different weight classes I asked specifically about. And I tried to break down the responses I got between those to get the data to be as fair as possible. Because obviously, if I just am like, you know, asking 100 random people about 100 random robots, and then I tell you the average cost to build a robot is $1,000, but you're trying to build a 150 gram robot, then that's not very helpful because it does not cost $1,000 to build a 150 gram robot. So, with that out of the way, let's talk a bit about statistics. One of the problems with trying to ask people how much they spend on a hobby is that a lot of people like spending money on hobbies and not everybody wants to spend money right when they get into a hobby. So the cost at the higher end is really, really, really high. So you can see here, I've got two charts. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but hopefully you can. So the chart on the left here has values with high outliers, which is the data set that we are working with today. The values on the right have normal data. So you can see if you look at the mean average, it's really, really high for the data on the left because there's like three values that are really high. But on the right, that mean is pretty much in the middle of the data set, as you would expect. So the information I think is more valuable for trying to figure out how much it costs to get into the sport is the first quartile and the median. So the way that you know, if you remember anything from middle school or high school math or whatever you're, you've taken so far, if you have a data set with like 50 numbers in it, if you just cut at the 25th number point after ordering them from lowest to highest, whatever value is in the middle is the median. And then if you, if you t cut at like the 12 number point or whatever, 
that basically you want 25% of the values lower than this number, that is the first quartile cutoff. So that first quartile number is a value below which 25% of the data and above which 75% of the data sits. The median value is the value at which below 50% uh, of the data and above 50% of the data sits. Um, so it doesn't matter how big any of the numbers are, it's just when you line them up in order, that's the middle value. So I think that that's better to represent this because if we look here, this is uh, the data that I got, the raw data basically for lifetime cost of running a beetle weight robot. You can see at the high end, people are spending $3,000 over the lifetime of a bot that may have competed at 10 or 12 events. Whereas at the low end, people who are just starting out are getting away with spending only, you know, 250 bucks or 300 bucks. So it's unfair to say that the, the average is, you know, the mean because the mean will be skewed really, really high. But the actual like value below which like 50% of people are spending might only be like 600 bucks. So hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, off of the boring math stuff, let's go into a bit more caveats here. Um, so obviously when I ask people to, you know, answer a survey, the people who like to answer surveys will answer the survey. Um, this is a problem with all surveys. It's called selection bias and it's a problem. So when I'm asking a bunch of people how much they spent on their robots, there are people who have built a bunch of robots that are happy to volunteer this data. And there are people who have built a bunch of robots who never want to think about how much money they've spent ever and refuse to. And then there are also people who are just starting out and put together a bill of materials and are like, oh yeah, I could respond to this. So there's kind of all types, um, but I can't say how many people fall into one camp or another. So, you know, just assume this data might not be perfectly representative of everybody in the entire hobby, since that would be, you know, pretty ridiculous. Um, also, Sponsorship, I asked people if they got any money from sponsors, how much it was, and uh, something like 85 or 90% of people said they get nothing, zero dollars and no machining or anything. So in the small robot weight class, it's very different from BattleBots where every robot is sponsored. And obviously it would be kind of like ridiculous to assume that you will get your robot paid for by some company by just asking them for free money. I think a lot of people when they're just starting out see people like me who have sponsors for their robots and like see all the BattleBots competitors who have sponsors for their robots and assume that they can just beg a company for money. That's not how it works. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yes, the, the VOD will save. You can watch this after. Anyway, moving on. Let's look at some numbers. So in terms of responses broken down by weight class, I had 45 responses in the three pound beta weight class. I had 22 between plastic ants and uh, ant weights. And I had 21 between obby weights and featherweights, though there are very, very few featherweight responses. And I think that they tend to be kind of low in terms of the actual cost of the bots. So that might not be super representative. Just keep in mind again, uh, you know, when I have like 20 data points, that's not going to represent the hundreds of robots that are out there perfectly. But I think it gives me a decent spread. All right, so here's looking at all of the data at once. For all 103 robots that I got responses for, including my own, the, you know, you can look at the average cost of what people are spending and the median cost of what people are spending. So essentially, like, out of the 103 robots that we're talking about, cost for their first competition is 500 bucks. The uh, cost to build a single robot with no spares, 300 bucks. And lifetime spending to keep the robot operating through all of the events it's competed in, 850 bucks, if we're looking at the median values. And you can see that those numbers are all much higher when you look at the mean. So again, it's skewed pretty high because of the higher end being so much higher. But anyway, um, you know, some people who have responded to this survey said their robot has never competed and they've never built another robot in this weight class before. Some people said their robots competed in 27 separate events and have built 14 other robots in this weight class before. So it's obviously a massive range of different types of builders. So again, that's why I think that the first quartile numbers are pretty important for somebody looking to just get started in the sport, because somebody who's been invested in the sport for years is going to spend more money than somebody just starting out. So yeah, um, I think that that $250 number for an out-of-pocket cost for your first robot is uh, a pretty good number in terms of like, you know, upfront investment. That probably doesn't include the cost of like, you know, your charger, your transmitter, your radios and stuff that's reusable necessarily, but I think it's still, you know, a nice ballpark for what to expect.
All right. Next. One thing I wanted to ask about was what tools people have access to and are using because it's really easy to drive the cost down by doing stuff yourself since outsourcing like CNC machining can be really expensive. Even like laser cutting, you know, adds up though it's much more affordable generally than like a 3D CNC machined metal part to get like a 2D cut laser cut part. So, um, I basically wanted to try and ask this in a way that represented as much people as possible in one question. So what I decided to do is ask about kind of a tier list of tools. So if you answered that you have access to tier four tools, including like a CNC router or laser cutter, I assume that you also have access to everything in tier three, two, and one as well. So tier one is just like hand tools. Tier two is a 3D printer. Tier three is like a belt sander, drill press, bench grinder, large like manual stationary tools. Um, tier four, would be like a CNC router or a laser cutter, like light duty CNC and nothing that's like a huge milling machine. Then like tier five would be like a manual mill and lathe or welding equipment for metalworking. And then tier six would be access to like a full machine shop with maybe like a CNC milling machine or a makerspace or university machine shop, which is like where I fall into because I have access to a makerspace locally. Um, you can also see I asked people not just what they have access to, but what the most expensive tool they own is. And basically everybody said it was either a 3D printer or a drill for the most part. <laughs> it's like 92% of people said that they have access to a 3D printer or more expensive tools. And about half of the 103 people I, res I surveyed said that a 3D printer is the most expensive tool that they own. I would say there was like 20 people who said some sort of CNC router or milling machine was the most expensive thing they owed. And probably another 20 or 30 people said that a hand drill or a drill press was the most expensive thing they owned. So a drill press and cordless drill apparently gets you pretty far in life. Next up, uh, this is the same information, just kind of broken down by how many people responded to each category. And then... Travel was another factor that I wanted to keep in mind because competing in the sport isn't just about building a robot, you also have to get to a competition. So if you live nowhere near a competition, uh, it's good to know, you know, what it might cost to actually compete. So like I said, the travel, ex but like you can see here, the travel expenses that people listed range from like $8 in gas to drive for like half an hour to $1,000 plus for bringing like a family of four to stay at a hotel for two nights and fly to and from a different state. So obviously there's a huge range within travel expenses alone, not just the cost of building a robot. But if you are local to a competition, you can find on robotcombatevents.com where competitions are within pretty much anywhere in the world. If there are some in your country or state, you can finally find it there and figure out where the nearest ones are that you could compete in, and more importantly, what weight classes they have so you know what weight class to start building in if you wanna get into it. Um, so yeah, about 25% of people surveyed said that they have flown to an event or regularly fly to events, and the rest only drive to events. Nobody said they primarily fly to events. And uh, also, I think only one person said they'd never been to a competition before, period. So that's interesting as well. Um, but yeah, there's honestly a pretty, pretty even spread in terms of distance people were driving. I was a little surprised. I thought that there would be fewer people who are driving like eight plus hours than people who are driving like less than two hours. But it's actually almost the same number, which is funny. But it, you can see about a fifth of people, one in five people, drive like two to four hours to get to events. And, you know, between that and the less than two hour crowd is like a third of people driving, you know, less than four hours to get to events. Uh, this is the same chart again, just in bar chart form. You can see the breakdown a little more clearly. All right, so getting into individual weight class numbers now. Let's talk about the beetle weights, because there's 45 entries for this, so this was like almost half of the data I collected was just for three pound beetle weights. So you can see, on average, the people that I surveyed, their bot has competed in almost four events, so the lifetime costs tend to be pretty high because of that. Um, the number of other bots in weight class they built also tended to be like you know two or three so this wouldn't be most of these people's first ever robot so their out-of-pocket expenses for their first robot you know might be higher or lower depending on you know how they approach it uh, you can see the most expensive bots uh, are in like the thousands of dollars range 
but the vast majority of entries were nowhere close. So if we look at like the median down here, like $600 for your first competition, I feel like that's a pretty fair number for Narwhalk, where the bots tend to be pretty expensive and competitive. And with the first quartile out of pocket being like 400 bucks, I think that's probably a reasonable place to feel like you could enter the sport at, with a three pound bot, somewhere in that realm, like four to 500. Um, single bot cost with no spares at $250 with the first quartile and $400 with the median. That is also like, you know, if you had to build multiple copies of your robot to show up for the competition, then you would expect that the, you know, out of pocket would be like twice that, but it's not, which means most people are in fact just building one robot and then showing up with spares. And then lifetime spending, you can see those get really, really high for people who are competing in a ton of events. So, you know, the median value I got over like 20 people out of like the 45 said that they spent over a thousand dollars over the lifetime of a robot that may have competed in a bunch of different events. So even 3000 or sorry, even $1,200 for the average mean and for the median. Moving on from that, this is a look at the graph for just all of the entries for out of pocket and for lifetime costs. So out-of-pocket count is on the left in green, lifetime costs on the right in red. The maximum value on the scale for the graph is 1,500 for the out-of-pocket and 3,000 for lifetime costs. So yeah, obviously people are willing to spend a lot more of the lifetime of a bot and invest in keeping that bot running over a long period of time. Looking at ant weights and plastic ant weights in the United States, this is definitely a lot cheaper than beetle weights. And it's pretty, it's honestly pretty hard to find uh, the 150 gram fairy weight competitions in the US from what I've seen, at least in my area, there's like basically nowhere that hosts them. So I think ant weights are also a great place to start if there isn't a beetle weight cost or a beetle weight um, robot, you know, competition near you. Um, so yeah. One pound ant weights, you can see that on average, these people have competed in like two or three events again, but on average, they've built far fewer robots in this weight class with like 1.73 for the, the mean and only one for the median. And you can also see the, the first quartile values are really low, and, but they're actually a lot closer to like the median values in this weight class than they were for the, the beetle weights. So, yeah, I think that the plastic ants, yeah, definitely would most likely be cheaper. And you can probably do like something for like, you know, 100, 200 bucks pretty easily. You can also get, you know, in this, if you're looking at like the maximum here, you still get into the thousands, but there's like one or two entries that are in the thousands. It's not like most of the robots are getting that high. And you can see here out of pocket expenses. Like this is what I was talking about with those outliers, right? There's like two entries that said they spent over a thousand dollars and then every single other person was like 600 maximum. So that really skews these like the, the mean pretty high. Uh, is it worth to buy a 3D printer? Like probably for one chassis, if it's the only one you'll ever make, maybe not, but like over the lifetime of the sport, you will probably make plenty of use from it, and outsourcing things is always going to be way more expensive than making it yourself. I think 3D printers are, you know, probably one of the best value things you can buy in terms of tools, which is why 92% of people I surveyed own one. All right, next, let's talk about the tiny little boys, 150 gram fairy weights or UK ant weights. So these robots are even cheaper still than the one pound class. Um, the 150 gram bots are almost exactly one third the weight of an ant weight, just like how an ant weight is almost exactly a third the weight of a beetle weight. So, well, it is exactly one third if you're in the US, but for the UK beetles being 1.5 kilograms, it's different. Anyway, um, you can see that these bots tend to cost only like, you know, 100, 150 bucks here and there for that like first quartile. And even for the median, it's like 200 bucks for lifetime spending. I feel like is really approachable. And then for the means, like even the mean, like lifetime spend is like under 
So these bots tend to be basically like the entire thing is 3D printed, except for like all of the functional parts like motors and servos and whatnot. This class is definitely like if you have a nearby competition that you can fight in it, probably the best place to start out, especially if you want to custom build a robot, because, you know, there aren't a ton of fairy weight kits around, at least in the US, that you can just buy and throw together. But I think Turnabot sells them. They're one website that has those. And uh, if you can find a competition that runs them, then, you know, somewhere in like the $150 range would be enough to get started in a lot of cases, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, the maximum spend here, again, is like so much higher than uh, the medians and everything. All right, moving on, we have the hobby weights and featherweights. I kind of grouped these together because I don't have a ton of data, especially for the featherweights. Um, I feel like the featherweight values and the hobby weight values being very, very similar means that I'm not getting data for most of the more expensive featherweights, but at least this is something, right? You know, with the beetle weights costing, like, where are we at? The beetle weights are, you know, let's say the median's like 600, and then we're talking like a featherweight with the median being 950, but the 12 pounds being 1200. Uh, that seems a little off to me, but, you know, I think that probably the hobby weight data is a bit more representative. So you're looking at probably twice as much as a beetle weight overall in general. Um, yeah, the currency question, that is a good question. Somebody asked if the costs converted to euros would also factor in. I know some of the survey responses I got were from the UK and were in British pounds. I did try my best to convert those that said that in the uh, survey response. So yeah. Oh yeah, that is a good question. How did that $50 one happen? That was like a joke robot somebody built with spare parts they had lying around. So they didn't factor in the cost of buying those parts, which again, you know, it's a survey. Some people are going to calculate costs differently from others. I wouldn't necessarily treat it that way if it were me, but you know, it was actually a vacuum cleaner, as far as I could tell. I think it, the robot was called This Robot Sucks. <laughs> and then we've got the hobby weight and featherweight. You know, these are just combined. So all of the entries for both, again, there's like 20 or so between the two weight classes. So out of pocket expenses versus lifetime costs in red. So you can see the lifetime cost graph goes up to $6,000 and the out of pocket goes up to $3,000. I also wanted to talk a bit about like reducing costs. So yeah, honestly, I do agree. Buying a 3D printer is probably the best way to, in the long run, reduce your costs because I run a 3D printing service, which I mainly do so that, you know, people don't have to invest so much up front. So if you are just trying to get into the sport, you know, paying me to print a couple parts for you might cost like 20 to $50 or whatever. That's a lot cheaper than buying like a 200 to $700 3D printer. Um, so if you really don't know what you're getting into, that could be a good option. But in the long run, like 3D printing a chassis might cost you, you know, two, three dollars in filament. Maybe if you're using an expensive filament, it could be like twelve dollars in filament. But like, I have a cost minimum of like that much because, you know, I need to live. <laughs> so I don't work for free. Um, so you're not going to get parts from me for less than like 15 or 20 bucks. Whereas if you own a 3D printer, that might cost, you know, if you're getting like a Prusa, which I have one, it's like $750 US. Um, and I've easily had it pay for itself through my 3D printing commission business. But even just looking at like the cost savings from printing like literally hundreds of parts over the couple years that I've had it, that I'm not outsourcing at a cost of individual dollars or cents per part versus paying somebody to even like the cost of shipping would be multiple dollars per part. So a 3D printer is definitely like the best investment you can make, I think. And if you don't have $700 to spend on a 3D printer, that's fine too. The other reason that my 3D printing service exists is because a lot of people buy the cheaper 3D printers like an Ender 3 that can't print with like engineering filaments like nylon or carbon fiber nylon and if you can't afford a printer that costs way more or don't feel like learning all the things you need to know to modify an ender 3 or what have you to print in carbon fiber nylon 
for all of your prototyping, you can do it super cheap in PLA or PETG. And then you can pay me to print the final versions of your parts in carbon fiber nylon or TPU or some other trickier filament. So, or, you know, obviously I'm not the only person who does this. There are other 3D printing services, but a lot of them are geared at like engineering companies and tend to cost a lot more than my service does. The, my pricing is listed on my website. You can look it up. There's links in the description for this, hopefully. So yeah. The number one way to, des to reduce costs is designing for what your own capabilities are and not outsourcing. So like I said, if you own a 3D printer, use it. <laughs> if you can access a makerspace, instead of paying some company in China to make parts for you, use it. If all you have is a hacksaw and a drill, you can design a robot that you know you can build by just printing out paper templates on a normal you know office printer and then cutting those shapes out in plastic and bolting it together. And you know, that's like how bots like Yes Chef or like the first version of Shred It Bro basically exist, is they're just flat plastic sheets that are screwed together with holes in them. Um, also asking friends who have access to more expensive tooling to, you know, do you a solid and you know make a part for you, or maybe you just pay them way less than it would cost like some engineering firm to make the part for you. Um, that's always a good option. I also strongly recommend not buying just the cheapest thing that like barely works because usually in the long run, these things will break more easily and burn out and not last as long, especially when it comes to things like your LiPo charger, where it's like, you know, if you charge your battery incorrectly, it can literally explode and catch fire and burn your house down. You don't want to cheap out on that. Um, for like a 3D printer as well, or even like a CNC machine, once you get to the point where you're comfortable spending that kind of money, I feel like it's usually better to buy the most expensive tool that you can afford and kind of buy once, cry once, where you get the thing with the most capability that you can afford in the moment, and that way you don't grow out of it as your ambitions, you know, increase as you stay with, you know, building things, even if it's not just combat robots. Like, 3D printers are useful all the time around the house. I'll, like, 3D print brackets for, like, my pegboard to hold tools or for my shelves and making, like, repairs to little things where plastic parts break, stuff like that. Um, also, yeah, do your homework. I think the number one mistake that people make with building their first robot is that they blow up their electronics. I have a bunch of tutorials specifically about how to not do that. And it com it's a combination of learning how to solder properly and practicing to get your soldering correct and learning how electronics work and the wiring actually needs to go. And then just like learning what components work together correctly. Um, I go over at least two of those things, if not all three, in my various videos on the subject. I don't have like a soldering tutorial, but you can find tons of those on YouTube or wherever else if you need them. And also uh, expect stuff to break. This is a combat sport. Things die. <laughs> Sorry, that's kind of the name of the game here. So I strongly recommend against just buying one of something because like if you're, let's say you're wiring up your robot, you buy like one speed controller and then you make a mistake and blow it up. You might have to wait like a week or two to get another one in the mail. And that's like an absolute, you know, killer for productivity and you know excitement for somebody who's building their first ever robot to just not be able to make any progress anymore because they have to wait weeks for a new part to come in. So anytime that I'm looking at sourcing parts for my bots, if I'm just trying out something, even for the first time, I'll usually buy two of it just in case one of them fails or is dead on arrival so that I can keep making progress quickly. And then outsourcing adds up. Uh, send, cut, send, SCS is probably the cheapest outsourcing thing that you can access in the United States here because they will cut, you know, everything from carbon fiber and titanium to aluminum and steel. They're how I get like all the armor and weapons for division and a lot of my other bots. And they are relatively affordable considering that they're using CNC laser cutter and water jet and CNC routers to cut parts for you which those machines, you know, I mean, like an industrial laser cutter could easily cost over $200,000. So that's not something that somebody has in their garage, like ever. <laughs> but, you know, when they're making thousands of parts a year, then it can pay for itself with the parts only costing a few bucks each. All right, that's all I have on the presentation side of things. Um, any bots that answered that the cost surprised me? Let me check. I'm sure there are some that said that they would be okay with being singled out. So this is the actual raw data from the survey. And you can see that cheapest robot here was this 12 pound robot called This Robot Sucks. And uh, you know, this is a guy who has access to like an expensive CNC machine, but 
just threw together a robot with spares that he had lying around. So it's just a for fun thing. It wasn't trying to be competitive or whatever. Um, all the robots that you can see their names were people who said they were okay with being singled out here. So I'm not scared to show you this. There's some that are blacked out here that said they didn't want to be singled out. Like you can see with all the no's here on the right column. Um, if I look at like just the most expensive robots in terms of like out of pocket costs, um, we can see, you know, again, a 12 pound robot is the most expensive. You can see all three of these for 12 pound robots. They're the three most expensive ones. And, uh, these are also some of the robots that like this robot here, Kaleidoscope, you can see at Norwalk Havoc, they were like this really beautiful welded aluminum frame white robot with a purple spinner, and they were sponsored by a company called Lidos, hence the name Kaleidoscope. So they got $5,000 in, you know, cash or machining uh, sponsorship, and they spent all of that money building their robot. So, you know, like their out-of-pocket costs, if you factor in the fact that they were given money to build the robot from sponsors is like basically nothing uh, but that like you can see here is an extremely lucky situation to be in almost none of these other robots even the most expensive ones are getting any sponsorship money um yeah also yeah i have uh my own parts store obviously so i don't sell everything you need to build a robot yet but slowly building up so i have these uh new drive motors called the dart box motors where basically it's a 22 millimeter planetary gearbox with all steel gears mated to a really really powerful motor that's typically used for nodding uh, dart blasters which is from a company called out of darts so that's why they're called dart boxes um definitely not infringing on any particular blaster company's trademark with the naming so yeah you can basically drive these with the I said I have to edit this still, but I have a, a dual speed controller, which I sold a few of, but they're out of stock again because everyone bought them in like two weeks and I'm waiting to get more. But this is one of the most approachable ways to, to build a robot is if you were to get something like my all-in-one PCB and you can just do all of the wiring for your robot's drive system just like this. This is literally everything. You just plug the battery straight into the board. It has a switch built into it that turns the board or that turns the whole robot on and off and then that sends power to the speed controller which then can power and get signals from your receiver and drive both of the motors on your robot and it's pretty lightweight at just like half an ounce so it works pretty nicely for for making a drivetrain i've had a few people use them in competitions now and they are uh working pretty well for for most people who aren't doing like direct driving wheels on the axles because I mean there's only so much you can do to prevent uh, a four millimeter axle from snapping so if it's going to take a direct hit it's probably going to break but if you have protected wheels or you're belt driving your wheels they work really really nicely for that um, when are the Terracan dual speed controllers coming back in stock I don't know for sure I think two or three weeks hopefully but uh, Mark Ronson is the guy who like makes and designed them and so I I've been emailing back and forth with him for a bit and that's about what he told me. What are the relevant calculations for a drive motor? Well, you see, I actually have a video on that subject right here and a part two right here. This video has a calculator that shows you literally everything that you would need to know to figure out with a given motor if it will work for your given robot. So you should probably check this one out I'll link it down below. But yeah, I've got a ton of tutorial videos. If you haven't seen most of them, then uh, there's a playlist that contains like all of them uh, right here. So there's like apparently 30 of them. <laughs> but yeah, the my vi my tutorial videos tend to be very long because I go into a lot of detail, which, you know, doesn't necessarily perform well on YouTube, but hopefully people find them helpful. <laughs> I've done fewer of them more recently because it's a lot of work to produce them for them to, like, not get very many views. But I still want to keep making more. This video being 
kind of one of those types of videos that maybe, I mean, this is a live stream, so it definitely won't get as many views as like a produced video would, but hopefully it's helpful information that helps people who want to get started in the sport. That's kind of my whole, my whole goal with this whole YouTube channel was to try and help get people started in the sport of combat robotics and share my love of it with all of you guys. Editing Seth here again. Hope you liked that video. If you did, make sure to click like. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure to subscribe and click the bell icon, although most of my videos are actual videos and not live streams. And as always, thanks for watching.